Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. In November of last year, the state Supreme Court ruled Tennessee's mandatory 51-year sentence for juveniles unconstitutional. But previously, under this law, anyone found guilty of first-degree murder in Tennessee had to serve 51 years in prison before any chance at release. And that included minors. It was the longest mandatory prison time for juveniles convicted of murder in the nation. Starting in the 90s, more than 200 juveniles in Tennessee were handed this sentence. Alamir Nance was one. He was 16 when he got the 51-year sentence for an armed robbery at a radio shack in Knoxville, even though he wasn't the one who pulled the trigger. He was an accomplice to 20-year-old Robert Manning. Alamir is now 43. He's been behind bars for 26 years. I've been here through my whole 20s, 30s. I haven't, I haven't been outside the fence. When they say count time, I got to go in the room. They lock the door, I can't come out. I'm missing life. I'm missing the world. I'm missing it all. Almir's story is the subject of a documentary that came out last summer from Al Jazeera's Fault Lines. It's called 51 Years Behind Bars. We spoke to Jeremy Young, the producer behind the documentary, last June. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate you being here. So tell me, how did you first come across Almir's case? Well, first of all, Khalil, I mean, we had the opportunity to do this story anywhere in the country. And we just gravitated towards Tennessee because there just weren't other states that were incarcerating teenagers for as long as Tennessee was. And we wanted to look for a story that hadn't been covered and hadn't been dissected. And we found about Almir's story through an activist in Knoxville. And, and once we latched onto it, we knew it was a story that we wanted to tell and wanted to report out. What stood out to you about his story? Well, I think one of the things is that this was a very high profile crime. It was labeled the Radio Shack murder, and it got a significant amount of press coverage at the time. And since then, nobody's really gone back to look at the details of the case. Uh, no one's gone back to see what happened to the people that were involved. And the more we started just reporting, the more we found out about the story and about Almir. And uh, it was just a, a really tantalizing tale. So as you were like kind of looking for stories to cover, I understand you were interested in looking into life sentencing. Why? Well, the United States uh, really stands out alone in the world in incarcerating uh, juveniles and teenagers for life sentences. And in the documentary, we go through a range of reasons in which uh, why children are generally treated different by criminal legal systems around the world. But in the United States, no. And um, it just it, it, we knew it was a story that we wanted to tell. And Tennessee just really seemed like the right place to do it. So you dug into this 51 year sentence in Tennessee. Break down for our listeners. What is so significant about that? Well, I think when you think about it, it's it means that somebody who commits a crime uh, or takes part in a, in a, in a murder uh, as a teenager is going to be in prison until they come out as a senior citizen. And that's just a really uh, tremendous concept to think about that a 51 year sentence is a significant amount of time. I mean, even Almir served 26 years in prison. He's 43 now, but guess what? He still has 25 years left to serve. Mm. And that's just a tremendously long sentence. Well, how, how do Tennessee's juvenile sentencing laws, how do they compare to that of the rest of the country? That's a good question because, you know, the Supreme Court has made a series of rulings over the last 15 or 20 years that in general has pushed the United States towards sentencing uh, juveniles in a different manner. And in many states, you'll see that around 25 to 30 years, um, someone can become parole eligible. And they'll have to have demonstrated a range of of different uh, aspects of their life for them to be able to, to get out via parole. And, and we know that it's not easy to make parole. Oftentimes it takes multiple visits before a parole board uh, before you get released. 
But, you know, if the law in Tennessee had reverted to what it used to be, Almir Nance would be parole eligible at this point in time. So as we mentioned ago, a bit ago, you know, Almir isn't didn't actually pull the trigger. Can you explain how it is it that he could still get this sentence? Absolutely. So felony murder uh, is a concept. Again, this is not only in the United States, but very few countries around the world have felony murder convictions. And basically it means that if you take part in a felony in which someone is killed, even if you are not the person who caused the death, you can be held accountable for that person's death. So in Almir's uh, case, he was convicted of felony murder because he took part in this robbery and he was given a mandatory 51 year sentence as a result. So on that note, there was another juvenile involved in the armed robbery, Amanda Good. She was also 16. What happened to her? Yeah, Amanda's sentencing was was very different, and, and some people might say much more appropriate for a 16-year-old who was involved in a crime like this. Uh, she served one year in prison and received 22 years probation for her role in the Radio Shack murder. And 22 years probation is a significant amount of time as well. But again, very different than a 51-year mandatory sentence behind bars. You spoke with Randy Nichols, who was the district attorney at the time. What did he tell you about the difference between the two sentences? Well, it was very interesting talking to him because he, um, he said that he was part of the effort in Tennessee to change these laws. I believe the term he said was, we were cooking with gas, and he believed that these long sentences were necessary. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, he said, you know, 25 years later, um, you know, th it hasn't worked. And he recognizes that it hasn't worked. Now, he doesn't have any uh, guilt about uh, the conviction of Almir Nance. He says uh, Almir had a gun. He went into the store. He knew he was going to rob the store. And he doesn't lose any sleep over Almir Nance getting a 51-year sentence. But he did recognize that these long sentences haven't worked as he thought they might. Mm -hmm. So how did what Nichols said, how did that sit with you? Well, it, it, was, it was really honest in some ways. You know, it's not really the line that you get out of most district attorneys or former district attorneys. In general, this is true in Tennessee as well as a, a number of states. They're very, very influential in the legislature and often uh, serve as a significant barrier for reforms in the criminal legal system. Uh, so to hear him kind of declare sort of a, a mea culpa for his role and recognizing that it didn't work, we thought was very stunning and, and really significant. So I'm, I'm curious, did you think that there were other factors in the difference between how Amanda Good and Almir Nance were sentenced? Well, we know that, I mean, let's be clear that Robert Manning, who was 20, and Amanda Jo Good, who was 16, were both white and Almir Nance was black. And uh, one of the people that we interviewed, Chris Irwin, who was a retired public defender in Knox County, said you had a white judge, you had white prosecutors, white defense attorney, and then you had this black defendant who got nailed, as if Al Nance was almost the only black person who was involved in this entire process. And so, you know, Chris said the issue of race permeates this entire case. And, and, and I do think that's true. We know because felony murder convictions can be used against drivers who are involved in felonies and involved in crimes. Um, so race sticks out. I mean, gender is another difference between Almir and Amanda as well. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a very glaring difference between a 51 year sentence and, and one year of incarceration. You know. I'm sure some listeners may think that 51 years is pretty reasonable for murder. But when we factor in that these are juveniles, how, how does that complicate things? Well, and also remember, this is a felony murder conviction, Khalil, which means, you know, it's different than, you know, someone who, who commits a murder straight out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we know f a, there's a range of things about juveniles. In particular, they're more susceptible to peer pressure, which was true in Almir's case. They're more susceptible to making bad decisions, which was, uh, you know, part of Almir's case. And also the, the main issue that has been cited in, in the Supreme Court has been brain development. We know that juveniles' brains continue to develop into their 20s until they're, you know, around 25 years of age. And so, you know, I think that's why so many different countries treat juveniles and treat children differently than adults when it comes to sentencing. Now, getting back to Almir just for a minute, the clip we played earlier was from the documentary. 
And I understand that you met with Almir back in April for that interview. Tell me, what was that experience like? Yeah, it was really interesting to be able to actually sit down with him and spend some time with him and get to know him personally. It's very different. I, you know, one of the things that the, the feedback that we've gotten is that so much coverage of the criminal legal system, you know, the people who are in prison are faceless, our numbers, our names, but you don't actually get to meet them and get to hear from them. And certainly you don't get to have them use their own voice to advocate for their position and and and, and for what they're going through. And so the opportunity to include you know, Almir's voice as part of our piece and to be able to kind of string it throughout the story uh, was really significant and I think made a real difference in people being able to see who Almir is at age 43 and how different that is from how he was at age 16. How did he seem when you spoke with him? Well, I mean, he uh, projects sort of an aura of um, you know, society might say that, you know, we should be thrown away forever, but I don't have to think that way about myself. He takes part in education classes. Um, you know, he's a very spiritual person. Um, you know, in, in some ways, I think the term that he used is that he tries to be a light even from a dark place. And part of that is for his family. He wants to make sure that his family remains upbeat and enthusiastic and that he's still going to be a presence in their lives. And, um, I think that really comes across when you meet him personally. So, you know, you have released this documentary. What's next? Will you keep following this? Absolutely. I mean, I think what's next in Tennessee, and I'm sure some of your guests will get into this, is that the Tennessee Supreme Court is currently considering a case that's very similar to Almir's. It's a case that's called the Booker case or the Tyshawn Booker case. And he was a 17-year-old, I believe, who was convicted also of felony murder. Um, they've heard arguments in, in front of the Tennessee State Supreme Court. Uh, the state of Tennessee has argued 51 years is not a life sentence because eventually the individual will get out of prison. And you asked before about why we wanted to do this story. When I heard that argument, I just felt like it was so disingenuous. We know the life expectancy for people who serve, especially decades in prison, is much lower and the idea that a 51-year sentence is not a life sentence made me want to follow the story more and do more reporting about it. Jeremy Young is the senior investigative producer at Al Jazeera. The documentary he, he produced on the case of Almir Nance and Tennessee's juvenile sentencing is called 51 Years Behind Bars. We've got the link to it on our website, and it's available at, Nashville, at thisisnashville.org. Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Khalil. Thanks for tuning in to this rebroadcast of our 2022 episode about Tennessee's 51-year sentence, which state Supreme Court struck down in November after reviewing the Tyshawn Booker case. When we come back, we'll talk with the daughter of Elmer Nance and one man who would still be in prison today if he had committed his crime just five years later. Stay with us. This is Nashville. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. Before the break, we were talking with producer Jeremy Young about the Al Jazeera documentary, 51 Years Behind Bars. It highlights the case of Almir Nance, who was locked up at 16 years old for being an accomplice in a murder at a Knoxville radio shack. He had to leave his own childhood behind and that of his daughter, Jamiriel. I've never been able to take her anywhere but to a vending machine. You know, but we get along as much as we can in any way I can be a support, a source of hope or something. So I get to tell them now that I'm in school and I'm doing something. They know it's not just sitting in here, you know, rattling cups off the bars like you would imagine. Jamiriel Johnson is with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. So how are you today? I'm all right. How are you doing today? You know, I'm doing OK. I'm doing OK. Tell me a little bit about your father, Almir. What was he like? Um, he's like literally my best friend. Um, 
He's very easygoing, easy to talk to, um, always positive, always in a good mood. Um, you know, just he's he's my best friend. He's literally always in a good mood. What are some of your favorite things about him? Um, <laughs> literally everything, but specifics. Um, he's, um, you know, he used to sing to me a lot. Um, I just love him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Literally everything. I can't even tell you specifics because just everything about him, really. I love it. <laughs> a lot of people who know my father say that I am his spitting image. So I have to ask you, did you pick up? Any personality traits from him? Oh yeah, definitely. Which um, which ones? <laughs> um, I would say I'm probably goofy like him. I can, you know, we're both talented singing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I look like him, of course. Um, yeah, his personality probably. Mm-hmm. It's the so, same. Yeah, so. You know, your dad's been behind bars your whole life, and you've really only gotten to know him through visits to the prison. Tell me, what, what has that mm-hmm. been like for you? Um, well, growing up, it was, you know, well, it's always been like normal to me. So, you know, growing up, it was just like, you know, I'm going to go see my dad. I was always happy about it. And then, like, I got a little older and started wondering, like, you know, why do I got to come here to see you? And so as I got older, it got a little bit harder, but, um, you know, then I got older than that and I understood, you know, so it used to be really hard. How often do you have a chance to talk or visit with him? Um, I talk to him as often as I can almost every other day, whenever he can call. And, um, I just got back, um, updated on his list, um, they hadn't seen him in six years, and I went and seen him like two weekends ago. So that was amazing. How was that when you visited? Uh, with it him? was, it was great. Mm-hmm. Just talked all day. Yeah. <laughs> now this documentary it came out last week, and of course you knew about it. You were interviewed for it. Tell me, what was mm-hmm. your what was your reaction when you saw it? Um, I was really just like surprised because I'd never you know actually heard the story until then like from like he's never told me the story I kind of like got into it myself younger but I really never like dug that deep into it so at first it was um kind of overwhelming like to see the people that were involved you know the sheriff and all of that it was kind of like it was overwhelming at first so Yeah, it was kind of a lot to process, but I'm dealing with it. (laughs) What are you doing to help yourself come to grips and understand this story and how it's affected your father and yourself? Um, I really just keep rewatching it. I don't like, because he was so young, I can't stop like, you know, watching the video, going back, replaying his voice, you know, hearing how young he was, seeing how young he was, it just really like breaks my heart that they didn't even, they just did him like that. Like he was nothing. It really just, yeah, it's hard. (laughs) If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about the 51 year sentence in Tennessee. It's the only state where juveniles can receive this sentence. And we've been talking about Almir Nance, who was convicted in 1996. My next guest nearly faced this kind of sentence himself. Raheem Buford served 26 years in prison for felony murder. He's now an advocate for sentencing reform, and he joins me now. Raheem, thank you for being here today. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, you know, tell me a little bit more about yourself and your journey. Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, South Nashville, migrated to Northeast Nashville, and had a fairly normal childhood, except when violence appeared, my stepdad and ended up getting into a lot of trouble with my older brothers, found myself in juvenile. And next thing you know, um, I'm being charged with felony murder. And so that was a journey uh, to survive the prison industrial complex here in Tennessee, seven different prisons and seeing so many people killed you know, in front of me and 
believing that, you know, it's a chance that I would die in prison and family members dying off, not understanding the pain that I caused, not just in terms of the victims, but my own family members and just that separation and being hidden and feeling like I was thrown away. I, I'm really, you know, just to be here today, I, I can't even put it into words. I don't have the words for it because I just don't even know how it happened. Mm. You know, you, re you received a 30-year sentence in 1990, of which you served 26 years. You know, I mentioned earlier, if you had been sentenced just five years later, you may have faced the 51-year sentence that Almir is currently facing. You know, meaning we may have not met you today. And, and you said that, you just said that, you know, you don't have the words to say that how you've been here. But, you know, talk to me a little bit about, about what that's like. Yeah, that's true. But I also want to say that when we talk about a life sentence and the 30-year percentage that I had to serve in terms of overall sentence, you know, it was based on a 60-year sentence, and it just keeps changing. And so I, I paroled a life sentence. I'm on parole. Okay. And so, um, you know, when I think about my life and what I became as a result of just the spiritual part, I'm, I'm a believer, I believe in God, and just growing educating myself, meeting people, and developing relationships and forming a community in prison, it's the reason why I can say I actually made it to this side. And so many great people that I've met over the years, um, being in Vanderbilt Divinity School, Lipscomb University, Ohio University, leaving prison with a, a scholarship and immediately enrolling into American Baptist College, and just really pursuing those things that I believe were important to me and to prove that when you throw people away as though they can't be redeemed, the question that comes to mind is, what 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 is a life? Because when you make bad choices, that we should be accountable for those choices. But when young people are being influenced and maybe even growing up in trauma situations, being around violence, um, they need a little bit more help. And we know the brain um, isn't fully formed. And just to just say that they don't deserve another chance. I mean, it's it's just something I can't, I can't wrap my mind around because I'm no different. Mm. I'm no different, you know, and just listening to Almir, I mean, I, I'm just, it's just like, it's, it's flashbacks because his whole life was my life. The only difference between he and I is that I had a different percentage of time to serve. And I, you know, I thought about all the people that I met over the years because I used to work on death row in Riverbend Maximum Security Institution. And there were people on death row with um, life sentence, death sentences that were only in the car. Mm. And I, I have friends who were in the car and the felony murder occurred. And, you know, I was convicted of felony murder. And so I know that um, district attorneys have the discretion. And in this particular case, the district attorney had the discretion. He chose to give another death sentence, even though we call it a, a, a life sentence with parole. We don't know of anyone in Tennessee that has survived beyond 43 years in prison. Mm -hmm. So we can basically say you die if you get a 51-year life sentence in prison. I want, I want to step back for a second and ask, you know, you mentioned how you changed things around. You've been to seven different prisons what happened while you were incarcerated that changed your outlook? What was that inspiration or catalyst? Yeah, I don't talk about this much, but I, I just want to put it on the record that, you know, uh, in 1989, I attempted suicide because I couldn't believe that I had made such a choice that, that took a life. And I had taken like 40 pills. I was on fifth floor in uh, the Davidson County Jail. I went to sleep. And... I woke up and I realized that I wasn't dead and I just prayed and I just asked God if he would just give me a chance to change my life, to be a better person, I would prove that what happened was not me and that I would I would become a better person. And so by the time I was microwaved through the criminal legal system in less than a year, I, I had a life and 20 year sentence, actually. Mm -hmm. I um, began to study education. I ran across brothers in, in Islam. They took me in. They helped me to become who I am today. I experienced a lot. My sister was murdered while I was in prison. I remember uh, looking at um, her body, and, and and I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, you know, this is 
This is what happened in your life. You did this to somebody. And just all the different things that you encounter. I was in a gang fight. I survived. Um, seeing 13 people murdered. I had family reunions in prison. I was the cellmate with three of my biological brothers. It's so many different things that impacted my life that made me want to be a better person. But I think most of all, I wanted my mother to know that it wasn't her and that she did raise me right. I didn't have a father there, but you know, I could be a better person. And those various transformations on the inside, I just kept striving and I'm here today. I'm almost seven years out. Come June the 25th, mm -hmm. graduated from college. I've worked for two nonprofit organizations. I have a great community of friends. And I've been out of the country. I've been across the country. I've been advocating for change. And what has happened in my life can happen for the lives of thousands of people who are still trapped in the criminal legal system. But for these legislators who have made these laws, who don't even live in the communities where most of these crimes are committed. And when you look at Shelby County, Davidson County, and Knox County, Knox County, where the majority of these offenses occur. And when you think about the people who make the rules or the laws to sentence people to 51 year life sentences, which are the legislators, they don't even live in these communities. Mm. And I just kind of think that it's not right for people to make laws where their lives are not directly impacted. And so I'm, I'm troubled by it all. You know, last year, you had the opportunity to address the Tennessee Senate Judiciary Committee. And in that address, you said that you were not special, that you got lucky, that you wanted to convey a message to them. Tell me, what did you mean by that? Yeah, people are always trying to point out that you're different. And people like, you know, one of my colleagues, Ashley, you're different. To say that those who are still caged, that they are not. And the reality is, is that it was only the law that was in effect at the time that I was sentenced that allowed for me to go before the parole board three times. And had that not been the reality, I would still be in prison today. And no one would know that the person I was, this 22nd me, was not the true person of my whole life. And that's one of the things that we have to understand about um, people like Armia and and the criminal legal system is that it doesn't see the humanity of individuals who end up um, being charged with these offenses. It gets the 22nd version of who or what something or what that person had done or maybe didn't do. It doesn't take into account their childhood, how they came up. And it certainly doesn't take into account what they have done the time that they have been incarcerated. And so one of the things that I have to do is put the human face, the human voice, and to show that, you know, people can be redeemed when you give a second chance to people like myself and Amir and many others who um, are still uh, looking for an opportunity, like my nephew. I mean, you don't know what can happen. I could have been anything. I could have been a doctor, a lawyer. I could have been an engineer. I love science. It's just that, but for those circumstances that I came up under, I didn't get that opportunity. In the new Al Jazeera documentary, 51 Years Behind Bars, there's a quote from Republican Senator John Lundberg. Let's listen. These are heinous murders and acts. Um, and the unfortunate part, I think we have to admit, and we may not like it as a society, but there are some folks who are just born bad. And some of those people, probably best that you're behind bars. So Raheem, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think... First of all, I want to say that that was a very, to me, an uneducated statement to make. Because when you look at the country we live in, America, everything that we deem to be a crime today built this country. Hmm. And let's, let's get these facts on the record. And so are you telling me that those who we look to as the founding fathers and those who built this country in terms of making it a society, creating a trail of tears, enslaving black people, and all of the lynchings, every single thing that has ever happened in this country, are you saying that those were bad people? And so we were birthed from bad people? Hmm. I just think that's the wrong statement to make, and it's a political statement, and it's not taken into account that some people grow up in a way that you know, extenuating circumstances in their life influence the choices that they make. And I would go a step further to say that when you say heinous, heinous crimes, there are some people on death row that have committed these particular types of acts. 
acts. But we're not talking about these kinds of people. The people that if you go into the Tennessee Department of Corrections and you meet people with 51 year life sentences and you look into their real true history and what happened in the crimes and the facts, you're not going to find heinous crimes. You're going to find crimes of passion. You're going to find crimes where in one or two, three seconds, that person made a choice to do something. But to make statements like that is to say that, you know, People actually can be born evil or bad. No, these things happen as a result of society. And I think that at some point we have to come to grips with the fact that citizens in our country, children in our country are being influenced by what's happening all around them. Jamario, I want to ask you, listening to Raheem and hearing that clip and having this entire story about your father, what do you want people to know about your father and about people's ability to get second chances? Um, I just want people to know that he's definitely not the same person. He wasn't a, never a bad person, even when it happened. Um, but I just want people to know that people definitely deserve second chances. And there's no way that, you know, people shouldn't have a chance to, you know, get out and better themselves or even prove to the system that they're better. That is Jamiro Johnson. Her father, Almir Nance, was a ju juvenile sentenced to 51 years. She was joined by Raheem Buford, founder of Unheard Voices Outreach. Thanks to you both for coming on to the show, and I really appreciate you both sharing your stories with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this rebroadcast of our 2022 episode about Tennessee's 51-year sentence. Since this episode first aired, the state Supreme Court struck down this law, finding it unconstitutional. When we come back, we'll dive into how exactly things got to be this way in Tennessee's criminal justice system in the first place. We'll be right back. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. This hour is all about Tennessee's 51-year sentence. Until recently, ours was the only state in the nation where juveniles faced this mandatory sentence. Then, in November, the Tennessee State Supreme Court ruled this law unconstitutional. But starting in the 1990s, more than 200 juveniles were handed this sentence. My next guests are very familiar with this system. Dawn Diener has been a lawyer in Nashville for 26 years, most spent as a public defender. She's now director of the Choosing Justice Initiative. And Reverend Jeannie Alexander is the co-founder of Tennessee's No Exceptions Prison Collective. Thank you both for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dawn, can you give us a history of sentencing laws in Tennessee? Like, how did we get to where we are today? Well, we got to where we are today because of tough on crime laws that came about in the uh, 1990s, uh, frankly, under the Democratic presidency of Clinton and Biden. And, um, and, 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 lots of money being given to states by the federal government to enact these tough on crime sentences and punishments. Uh, and Tennessee was one of the states that bought in and so took what was a 25 year parole eligibility on a life sentence and turned it into a 51 year calendar year life sentence. You spent years as a public defender. How did that experience affect your views on sentencing? Well, um, I think the, the most significant thing I would say, and I'm reminded of it by watching the piece um, on Almir Nance, was Almir Nance's mother said, if you are poor and black in the criminal legal system, you are basically, um, you know, you're in trouble. You won't get any justice. And I think that, that probably 26 years later, working in the court system here in Nashville, Tennessee, I think that that's real. Um, I think racial disparities and racial injustice is a significant factor, and so is class and wealth. And, um, you know, that's why I started Choosing Justice Initiative was really trying to work more directly on addressing wealth-based disparities that exist in the criminal legal system and trying to end them.
I want to ask you a little bit more about that a little bit later in the, this segment. But Randy Nichols is the former district attorney of Knox County who oversaw Almir Nance's prosecution in 96. In an interview with Al Jazeera's Fault Lines, he talked openly about his role in tougher sentencing. He says the ongoing conversation in the 90s was about longer sentences and strict, stricter treatment of juvenile offenders. Let's listen. I've acknowledged uh, my misjudgment. Uh, there's no doubt in 96, and we were talking to, uh, to the federal authorities, and we were trying to toughen up. The General Assembly here was on our side. We were getting, we, we were uh, cooking with gas, uh, the district attorneys were. We had a wonderful relationship with the General Assembly. We could articulate what we thought the proper changes were, toughen up, and I was right there in the front row. I, I admit, I thought I was right. Uh, and I thought that's what we needed to do to tackle the problem. I believe that. Uh, in hindsight, I missed the point. Jeannie, <laughs> what's your reaction to that? Oh, my God. Um, my reaction to that is that I, I really have a hard time believing that we have stepped right back into that insanity today. Mm. The Tennessee General Assembly just passed a new truth and sentencing law, and they have doubled down on that and increased the number of offenses, which are now at 85 or 100 um, percent. And so I, I appreciate the fact that uh, he was honest about, you know, acknowledging he was wrong. Um, and that's what's so frustrating. Now we have almost 30 years of people acknowledging, you know what, we were wrong. And now Tennessee is taking a giant step back in the face of positive movement that we've now generated. We have been working at the legislature for eight years at this point. We were making great strides and progress. Um, and, and, and all of that is um, come to a screeching halt, quite frankly, at the moment. So it's, it's very frustrating. It's very um, disheartening. But you continue to do the work because we are talking about people's lives. Um, mm -hmm. And people's lives do matter. Um, so break this down for me. For any of our listeners who may not know, what is truth in sentencing exactly? Okay, so the idea of truth in sentencing is that if someone is given a sentence, uh, the victim's family and the person who's received that sentence, everyone will know exactly how much time that person is going to do, right? So if we're talking about life sentences, and we're let's take a historical approach to this just from Tennessee, mm -hmm. um, the idea from truth and sentencing is, well, if you say a life sentence, then a life sentence should mean for life. That means forever. Well, the reality is, is that isn't what it has meant. Um, a life sentence continues on after someone is released, if they are able to be released. There's no guarantee for that. And that person will be on uh, parole for the rest of their lives. So a life sentence never actually ends. It's just where you will complete that sentence is the issue. Um, in Tennessee, throughout the years, there's been a wide range of how long a life sentence was. Um, Rahim alluded to this. Um, and so, for example, when um, he received his life sentence, it was under the older life sentence um, uh, from the 80s. There were two different ones in the 80s. Um, mm. And so he did have that opportunity to go before a parole board. Um, and that was seen as normal. Okay, so, so there's nothing unusual about that. The national average for a life sentence with a possibility of parole is 25 years in this country. And that's been typical for Tennessee. What was abnormal is what happened in the mid-90s. Um, which in Tennessee resulted in, uh, quite frankly, three death sentences with the death penalty, a life without parole, and then a life with parole. Um, so this bill is set to become law on July 1st. Governor Bill Lee hasn't signed it, but he's letting it take effect in two weeks, essentially. Right. How does this bill impact the sentencing reform work that you've been doing for so long? Right. Um, so this bill actually doesn't even have to touch first degree murder for a life sentence because it's at 51 years and everyone acknowledges it's a death sentence. Here's how it does impact it. It's because the prior year, right, and, and in 2021, um, we had been working to educate the General Assembly and to move a bill that would have taken um, a life sentence with the possibility of parole back to that 25 years, right? basically back to where Rahim had been. You would come up for parole for a chance at 25. Um, 
And that's for everyone, not just juveniles. Um, and I think it's important to note that half of the people who have a life sentence right now, a 51 year in Tennessee, um, were youthful offenders. So they were 25 or younger. Um, and certainly the brain science tells us that these are absolutely folks who we need to take a second look at. So, but this, this, this life sentence would have given people a chance and it passed through the Senate. And you know, and what's interesting about that is Senator Lundberg is on Senate Judiciary. It passed out of that committee and it overwhelmingly passed in the Senate. In fact, it didn't just barely squeak by. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like an economic argument that won, which is what a lot of people presume. Uh, it was the moral argument. Um, it was the moral argument that was made um, by Senators Kerry Roberts, in particular, on the floor, and um, and Senator Bowling. That and they they base that in a faith statement, right? They professed a particular faith. They professed to be Christians and said, "We are talking about you know at least half of these people were kids. They were young. They were twenty five and under. And why?" would we foreclose the possibility of redemption or reform? Why would we not go back and take a second look? And so I think it's very interesting to hear Senator Lundberg say that some folks are just born bad because I'm very curious about how that squares with his theology. Hmm. Um, and even if w someone was to accept that premise, some folks are just born bad. Well, how would you know? Because you've literally shut the doors on over a thousand people in this state. Uh, people like Rahim, who, you know, I say is uh, a dear friend, and he's remarkable, but he's not unique. Mm. Um, there are so many stories and so many situations. And so that bill made it through the Senate this year during this legislative session. It came to, like I said, a screeching halt because the House was determined to not only not pass that, um, despite all of the data, by the way, showing that folks who are in on a first-degree murder charge who go out for parole after 25 years age out of crime. And so these actually are the safest people to parole. They have mm. like around a 1% to less than 1% recidivism rate. Um, no one wanted to hear the logic. No one wanted to hear the facts or to have conversations and look people in the eye who are serving these sentences. They shut it down and instead passed a truth and sentencing bill, um, which, as you've said, the governor has not signed. And in fact, he issued a statement about why he wasn't going to sign it, why he didn't support it. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't veto it. Hmm. Um, he didn't veto it. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil Lake Colonna. We're talking this hour about Tennessee's 51-year sentence. We're the only state in the nation where juveniles face this punishment. Now, in the documentary on Almir's case, 51 Years Behind Bars, we heard from his mom, Vicki Woodard. Let's listen. Definitely, if you're poor and black, you are doomed in a court system. It was definitely inhumane. And it was no justice done, no justice served. Nobody looked at him like he was nothing. And they knew he didn't deserve it, and they didn't care. Now, they Dawn, didn't care. Dawn, you mentioned this earlier. You know, talk about this disparity that you've seen in your work. Well, I think the, I think they are the same disparities that exist across all systems and structures in this country, whether you're talking about education or healthcare or housing or, um, you know, whatever institution uh, you want to talk about. Issues of poverty and race um, just pervade. Uh, the in, disparities and injustice just pervade all of those structures, and there's no difference in the court system. As in, you know, my years in the system, the vast, the majority of people in Davidson County who go through the court system are African American, despite the fact that they are a minority of Nashville's population. So you're going to see figures generally in the court system between 50 and 60 percent of the people who go through court mm. are African American. And yet, uh, you know, during my time here over the last 25 years, they've only comprised, African-Americans only comprised 20 to 25% of Nashville's population. Um, I think in terms of being poor and in the criminal legal system, the reality is that public funding for defense attorneys, for people who cannot afford to hire counsel is woefully uh, lacking. 
And there is absolutely no lobby to improve the kind of represent to improve the representation that individuals without means get in the legal system. I think frequently the, the idea is that legislators uh, and politicians don't want to fund lawyers for quote unquote criminals. Um, and so the reality is that people like Almir, like Rahim, um, like I would say most people who are serving life sentences in Tennessee's prisons right now, they generally receive a public defender or a court appointed lawyer who is likely overworked, underpaid, underexperienced, um, and with, that doesn't have any oversight or performance standards or any real check on, on are they providing the kind of zealous representation that people with money can obtain. And I would tell you, if you look in Tennessee's prisons, um, who is serving life sentences, I'd be shocked if you found many people there who come from families of means, because that just doesn't happen to people who come from families with money. Well, what can be done to kind of change this out so it's a little bit more of a fair and balanced judicial system as the trope often goes? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know if you make it fair and imbalanced. Um, frankly, I don't I don't know. I would think I've come to believe that it's just completely unreformable and needs to be changed and that we 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 use our criminal legal system to try to address societal problems. And we do that. And it's not successful in addressing social problems. Um, it just makes them worse and it maintains the power structures that exist of white supremacy and capitalism. Uh, and so, you know, what I advocate for is getting as many people out of the criminal legal system as possible and using different models like restorative justice and transformative justice that are really much more about healing and addressing underlying issues that led to people's behavior and that helps them, you know, not engage in the same things again, not have, not hurt anybody else and to address their own hurt. Um, you, you know, Jeannie, you've been at this for years. Where are we right now in terms of seeing actual change? Um, I'm optimistic and realistic. And where we are right now, um, I think we are in a very bad place, quite frankly. I agree with Dawn, the system itself, I don't believe is salvageable. Um, and that's one of the reasons why... Uh, she is a dear friend and someone who I collaborate with often, our organizations do, because we, we both understand this system, it's, it's a cliche, but when all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. Mm. And that's what we have. And I think the best that we can do is everything we can to get people out. But this system has to be utterly transformed. And it is a system that's predicated on racism. I mean, this is a system that is classist. And, of course, we're now in a state where... Teachers are already losing their jobs if they're talking about these realities, right? Um, and so I do believe there's a way forward, but I don't know that I believe there is a way forward within this system. Um, and I think we have to be vigilant and we have to, there has to be something else. And, and, and I agree that there are models of transformative justice that do, pre, that do present us um, with another path to go down. But I am not optimistic about working within our current uh, criminal punishment system, criminal legal system. Don, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, I think that, you know, that's the long-term vision. I think in the short term, yes. this is Nashville. And um, in Nashville, in local jurisdictions across the state, the people who have the power to make it a more just, more fair system locally are prosecutors and judges and the defense lawyers who are tasked with being the check against those power, that power. So prosecutors have a ton of discretion, as we, you know, Randy Nichols told us in this piece. Glenn Funk has a ton of discretion, and he just got reelected for eight years. So how do does this community want Glenn Funk to use his power and his discretion to pursue justice? And what does justice look like to us? And are we communicating that to him? How about our judges? How do we want our judges to use their discretion to create a more just community, a more just uh, world here 
for people who generally have been marginalized and persecuted within the criminal legal system, particularly. So I think those are the questions and the things that we can be thinking about locally that are really important in the short term. Well, I really want to thank both of you for coming on to the show. Truly, I really and truly appreciate it. That is Dawn Diener. She is the director of the Choosing Justice Initiative, and she was joined by Reverend Jeannie Alexander of Tennessee's No Exceptions Prison Collective. Again, thanks to you both for being with us. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to this rebroadcast of our episode from last June, all about Tennessee's mandatory 51-year sentence for juveniles, which the state Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional in November. Tomorrow, we'll be back with a brand new episode taking a look at the race to be Nashville's next mayor. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Tasha A.F. Lemley, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutho. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and let us know what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.